Welcome to the Performance Formula with Jody Martin. Yeah, Russell, um, I'm, yeah, I'm glad to be back here with you today. I think uh, we've sort of covered from this idea of this, you know, spirited cricket and what that is and how to go about that. We've sort of covered this from a couple of different angles. So I maybe just want to remind everybody and push them towards those. If this is the first conversation that they get to see, um, you know, so we spoke about the good news of the spirit of cricket and that the spirit of cricket is not something that should take you away from the laws, but rather that the laws are there to help us make sure that we maintain the spirit of cricket. And instead of us trying to find fault, or you, I love what you said, where we use the spirit of cricket as sort of the thing to show us when we've stepped out of line. So it's almost like we use it the wrong way around rather than that's the guiding force that make the laws come to life. We use it as the thing to wrap each other on, you know, tap each other on the hand and say, hey, you've messed up. Um, and so then the second conversation was around that the spirit of cricket is actually a metaphor for life, that it impacts sort of wider parts of. Of us as human beings, that it's not just. So maybe, you know, my awareness certainly in that conversation was that it's not just for um, for the game, you know, and something that only sits on the field, that it, can, it has wider implications. And then in our last conversation, we sort of started this process, I think, of understanding that the, because there's something like the spirit is really difficult to measure. I think I asked you that question straight up and so that, that what came from that is the idea that relationships are super important and that's how you measure where you're at with the spirit. And so we're sort of following that trend and then today then we're covering this idea of the relationship you have with yourself. Because that's where it starts, right? Every morning you get out of bed and it's the first thing that goes through our minds. Who am I? How am I doing? Am I okay? Am I not okay? Am I on track? Am I going where I want to be going? Am I successful yet? Am I not? Am I winning? Am I not? And I think these things flash through our minds so quickly that at times we're very unaware that we're doing that. You know, it's so busy to get busy with other things that we actually miss that we do this every single day. Um, and so, yeah, I'm happy to hear your thoughts at the outset of this conversation. And then we'll sort of delve a little bit deeper around this idea of relationship with self. Shadi, thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, I, I like the fact that last week we emphasized relationships and that's why this natural flow into self, how you relate to yourself, comes up. Essentially, the strength of the relationships is going to also be dependent on how well you relate to yourself. You can only give what you have, right? And if you're kind of mistreating yourself or not treating yourself in a very respectful manner, that disrespect will be extended to others, unfortunately. So. The thing with self is a lot of people tend to have an identity crisis, which is, you know, there are a lot of angles and we can look at it and we don't want to go a psychological route in a sense, but identity crisis is something that's very prevalent within in sports, particularly even higher up sports, right? Um, because you tend to want to get the performance so that you can say you're someone or something now as a result of it, but it's, it's very short lived. And, and for the most part, that is not a, something you can, you know, it's a, pitch your tent on it and because it's not secure, it's not long term. So it's not going to be something that's very grounding and very settling. So as a result of it, I think one of the biggest things about the relationship with self, particularly within the context of competitive sport, is how you relate to the desires or the ambitions or the goals and targets that you've set for yourself. And I think that throws you onto a, a trajectory that can possibly derail you without even realizing it, the subconscious derailing. So you feel less than as a result of it, or it can be something that you, when you get it right within the spirit of the game as a guide, you can actually be reassured uh, and, 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 as, and settled as a result of it, right? And I think this type of conversation doesn't ever get brought up. We, what tends to happen is when we talk about self within professional cricket sporting codes, we only think about the fact that you have talent capabilities because we have spotted that you've got ability, right? So we say because of your natural giftings, you've got a flair and an aptitude to do this. 
which means that self uh, or the potential self of you being a star as a result of this gifting, that's enough. But the self is composed of more than just the, the gift, the talent, the hands and feet stuff, the things that you can physically do, the skills that you have. So you take the whole human being into the game as an example. You don't just take the cricketer with unique skill sets. And that's sometimes something that's overlooked, to be honest. So if you're not dealing with things well, the self tends to implode over a course of time because we don't give cognition to it. We only think about, oh, you're scoring runs, so you must be in a good space. Oh, you're taking wickets or you're winning matches first, so it must be in a good space. You know, these are the motivational factors and things like that. So for me, I think we, the spirit allows you to go a little bit more authentically and deeper into what that, what that healthy self really looks like. And I don't think a lot of people pay attention to it only, again, when things go amiss, when guys are feeling burnt out, when they're feeling a little bit the sense of depression, like is it worthwhile, or if they feel that they're feeling uh, worthless or whatever, when they're not getting out of form, out of shape, whatever, you know, those sorts of things. So it tends to only sh uh, pop up when the negative shows, not necessarily when the positive shows, but it goes both ways, unfortunately. I'm just going to pause here for this guy to walk past me with his thing. Yeah, the guy that washes the corridors. Okay. Um, sure. So, I mean, I love what you speak about, right? And the, a lot of that, in particular, this idea that we don't speak about this often. You know, and then you reference a couple of things there that I wholeheartedly agree with. And I think even in my own life, sometimes I'm still on a journey with some of this stuff, you know, but I think if you're aware of it, then you can at least catch yourself. So this idea of the identity crisis and that we, you know, I, I, my words for it is sort of you use, you use performance to define yourself. And so if I perform well, Hey, I'm valuable. I'm great. I'm worth something. I'm only worth something if I perform well. And if I don't perform well, then I'm worth less. And athletes will often express it like that. They will say straight up, I feel, I feel worthless, you know? And so should I rather give up the game? And the giving up of the game comes from sort of being in this place where the performance is not flowing and then therefore I am, I am not worth anything. My value cannot be seen. And so, I, I mean, that, it, it, yeah, it resonates so well. And, and I'm well aware that not a lot of people, and I say not a lot of people because I know there's not a lot of people that actually spend time figuring out what their value is what they can bring, what they can offer beyond hitting a ball, kicking a ball, throwing a ball, jumping, running, whatever it might be. And society, unfortunately, I think is driven in a way and driven in a place where we place a high premium on the performance, you know? I'm sure if you open up the newspapers in Australia tomorrow morning, you're not going to read a lot of good things about the Australian cricket team, you know? And I'm sure if you want to ebb and flow with this little journey, then the Indians might feel really good about themselves right now. And so I think what can happen very easily with people is they, they ebb and flow in their personality, in their character, in their behavior, all based on how they're doing on the field. So if we're winning, great. If you're a coach and my team's winning, oh, I'm happy, I'm bubbly, I'm freaking excited, let's go. If you're losing, well, then I'm miserable. I sit, lock myself in my office and I abuse myself till the end of the days for how stupid I am or worthless I am that I couldn't even get this bunch of cricketers or this bunch of rugby players or whatever it might be to perform better. And so I, I think, you know, just based on what you said there sort of initially, that more work can be done by everybody, you know. Because it's, I think it's an ongoing process. Like I said, even for me, I feel like there's parts of this where in certain areas or certain contexts where I'm nailing it, where, I'm, where I know I've shifted a lot, I've grown a lot. And then there's parts where it's, you know, it's still a challenge. You know, it's still, there's still that sort of a attachment to 
um, the outcome rather than just know, reminding myself who I am, what I'm about. And it took years for me to know and understand that about me. I mean, some other people might find it nice and quickly. That's not to say that it has to take years, but for me, it did. Because parts of the time I might have been looking for the, looking for the answer in the wrong stuff. Um, you speak there of a, um, an idea, right? That, so there's two sort of things. I'm wondering if you can comment on that to maybe add on whatever you feel else is needed based on what I maybe said or stirred there in your imagination. Um, but the one was sort of the idea of how this relates to the desires, right? And how that can either derail us or reassure us. Maybe if we could just go with that one first, then I'm not asking you too many questions. <laughs> and then I'll, based on what you are, based on where the conversations go, I might do a little rewind to the other one that I wrote down. Yeah. Yeah, there's some there's some interesting research out, uh, you know, that's been discovered and, and spoken of quite quite a bit on mammic desire. Like we 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 creatures or we beings that tend to copycat. We we don't know what to desire, so therefore we tend to copycat. So when we see samples. Let's use the cricket context of what a winner looks like. We tend to want to mimic that or compete or be exactly the same, right? So, so we kind of grab hold of an image of a previous champion, of a role model figure, of some form of example, and we tend to want to repeat that in, in our own version of it. So what that does automatically, because we got inspired by having this glimpse of what we want now, it creates this contentment on the inside because we're not quite that yet. So. The desire in itself may not necessarily, like there's two angles here. The fact that we mimic it, right, creates a sen sense of disparity because we're not it, right? That's the one thing. And that's fine, right? There's a gap now for you to grow, but that discontentment you have to deal with well, right? It's, it's a matter of understanding what environment would put you, what sort of environment is ideal, like what you always refer to, if the conditions are right to rain, it's in the rain naturally. So if the conditions, if you put yourself in a certain conditions in the right sort of fashion, hitting those goals and objectives is going to become effortless, right? It's become easy. But what we need to make sure of is the fact that those desires don't actually turn to the dark side. So for instance, you can have a situation where you can either have outward success, but you feel empty on the inside, right? Or vice versa. You can feel empty on the inside and never get the outside success because it has to be almost both. So that's why how you deal and relate to these uh, desires that are stemming, that are coming up, and how do you handle it, it's important. So would you want to just, this is my question I pose to, to, to some of the athletes and, and something that we can think about. Would you want to just achieve the shell of the outcome? Let's say you imagine lifting the World Cup as an example, right? And you see the captain doing this, and so you want to be the aspiring captain doing the same, you know, lifting a World Cup as an example. You just want the outside shell? Or do you want the inside capabilities that goes with the capacity to lift it, the cup? Because at the end of the day, if it's just the outside, you're still going to feel empty because post-achieving that, you're going to now look for the next thing that's going to need to satisfy. It's almost like a never-ending appetite, right? So it feels a little bit drudgery. It feels like it can derail you because now you achieve some form of glamour, some form of a taste of something but it's not quite as satisfying as you imagined because you slaved away if you want to work, if you want to use that word, you worked hard to get it. So much sacrifices along the pathway. And then it didn't quite hit that sweet spot of making you feel, oh, this is satisfied. I can actually now uh, have achieved this ultimate and that's it. You know, I can relax now. <laughs> right? It tends to still put you in the constant perpetual drive for the next thing. So the point is, I would rather have you have the sense of being a champion already on the inside so that when the cup comes, it's a confirmation of you already being a champion. So the cup doesn't have to be the be all end all. It has to be almost you groomed and grown in such a way that winning is almost inevitable. So, you know, I once said this phrase, and I know I'm kind of like just jumping two feet in here, but I don't know if you can recall me saying this phrase that. When you're standing on the podium receiving the cup, that's not when you feel like the biggest winner. Yes, the sacrifices you're reminded of, it, what it took to get it, but it's not then that you feel like a winner. It's having overcome in moments when you felt like a total loser and yet you pushed through 
and to recognize that despite what the outside looks like, which is all losing around you, as an example, your environment confirms you a loser, and yet still drawing in from an inner resource of you as a winner when you push through, that's when you truly feel like a champion. It's not when you're necessarily just lifting the cup. It's how much you overcome, both personally and professionally. Those are the winning moments. Those are the things that hit those spots. So the desires, desires has to hit both, really. These to hit both the inner world and the outer world in order for that to be a sweet mix of achievement. Otherwise, it's going to be an endless loop of actually just almost there, but not quite. And that for me, that I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that, that uh, illustrates the, the version of a small self where you are trying to drive towards uh, motivating yourself in this small self, just me and mine versus the bigger self with the big S because you both have both inner and outer capacity. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you know this guy, right? Uh, I haven't spoken about him once with you uh, in our conversations, but I don't know, maybe on social media you found him uh, in your own way. And I don't know if anybody else out there knows about this guy either. Uh, there's this guy, uh, his website is fearvana.com. Uh, I tell you what, I don't know the details of everything he's done in his life off the top of my head, right? His name's Akshay. He's currently, as you and I speak, he's on a 110 day quest across Antarctica, uh, where he's busy pursuing to become the first person that solo skis across Antarctica. He's pulling like a 400 pound sled behind him and I was watching him pull tires for the last year. But I don't actually know all of his backstory. I know he was in the military, maybe. There's a couple other sort of adventure type things that he's done. But this sort of has pulled my imagination to follow him. And so every evening he sends, I think he's on day 14. He's been there for two weeks now. Um, and on day 14 or 13, maybe, he shares the... Uh, every evening he shares an audio thing. So if you go on his website, you can, I think you can literally click on every single day where he slept over in Antarctica. You can click and you can listen to the audio that he shared from that space. I'm following him on Insta Instagram. I think he's just Fearvana on Instagram as well. Um, and so one of the things he said in the, in the last message was, well, the last one that I listened to was speaking about exactly this and and i think it's such a great practical example of somebody that's in the field busy doing this extraordinary thing so yes there's a performance and he says it in the thing in in in, in the audio he says i can i can reach the other side essentially of this journey but if i reach there i've realized that if i reach there and i'm not changed by the experience i don't come out the other side a different person then this whole thing is pointless. If I if I come out the other end and I'm just the same person that went in and 110 days later I come out and I'm the same person, then this doesn't mean anything to me. And so his pursuit is, yes, to achieve this extraordinary feat of human possibility, but that's not the thing he's really going after. The thing he's really going after is to be a different person is to change, is to discover more about himself, is to learn more about himself, is to struggle with himself a little bit more. I mean, I can only imagine, I love snow and I haven't been in an environment where it's all, I've once been in an environment where it's like all white around me. And it's, it's pretty daunting, right? It's pretty daunting to be in that brightness, that cleanness almost <laughs> all around you. To spend 110 days in that sort of temperatures and I, I think it's freaking extraordinary thing that he's busy doing but that's not the pursuit um you know this weekend i left, listened to a guy uh, on saturday i think it was um, and he spoke about i don't want to get into the whole thing but he spoke about um mission having a mission and then having values and uh, not values a vision having a mission and a vision and I love the distinction he brought to those two things based on our conversation. So it all starts like little puzzle pieces that come together in my head, the things I've been busy with. 
He says, your mission is essentially this thing that you and I are speaking about. That's how he defines it. Your mission is almost like what is the meaningfulness that you want to get out of something, right? We're meaning-making creatures as human beings. We do it all day long, every day long, and we can shift our meaning. And when we shift meaning, we get different performance, we get different results. And so when we pursue higher level meanings and we make things meaningful in some way, and, and in this conversation, meaningful about ourselves, how we look at ourselves and how we view ourselves, then I think we can manipulate, and manipulate's not a great word, we can affect how we act and how we are and how we are doing. And I think if we come from that place, then we being, then doing so that we can have. Instead of saying, and I think you and I have spoken about that stuff before, but then it, instead of saying, oh, I need to have, I must win. You know, and I know you and I said we maybe don't want to reference South Africa too much in, this convers in these conversations because we tread them through in another space. But right now, I'm just reminded of this idea that if you listen to what you hear on sort of these guys' social media, when there's news articles written, then it's always about we've got to win. We've got to win. And so it's, to me, it's the have becomes the big thing. Hey, having said that, we're not behind the scenes with them. We don't know, right? We don't know. It's a thumb suck. Um, but the ability to be meaningful with what you do, I think that takes time. And it's freaking scary. It's like staring at yourself in the mirror and being okay with that. And then warts and all, here we go, right? And then new awareness has come and life brings things to you and you lose a you lose something, you fail, and then and then what? You know, and I think it's all those little moments. I love what you said there. It's all those little moments that essentially get you to maybe lift a cup. It's all those little moments. That's actually the winning. That is, I'm winning this little moment. I'm winning this. I'm shifting. I'm defining. I'm gaining deeper insight. I'm understanding more. Shucks, I mess up again. Okay, well, let's go again. It's that willingness to just keep going and going and going. That's the winning at the end of the day. You know, and then maybe like Akshay, we can be what matters more is who I become through this process rather than saying, um, and maybe it's not about who I'm becoming, but maybe it's about discovering who I really am in the process. And that is more important than actually standing on the world stage and lifting this trophy, which I mean, Australia was, was, was World Cup champions uh, last year, this time. They were on a high. Now, a year later, they're in a low. Past D20 World Cup, they weren't great. You know, and so I think that lifting of the trophy doesn't last. We're pursuing an empty, uh, you know, an empty shell. It's a cup. Normally that thing is empty. It gets filled afterwards, maybe a celebration with some, some, something, you know. But it's empty when you receive it. And I think that emptiness of the cup is, we pursue it to fill that emptiness within ourselves. And I think if we can fill the emptiness inside ourselves first, then lifting a cup is not a big deal. Then we're okay with whatever outcome. And so we won't see people shatter on the ground because I'm now so miserable. I mean, sorry, I know I'm drifting here, right? Formula One this weekend, just this past weekend, Max became the four-time world champion. Lando was pursuing him the whole thing. But there's a moment there where Lando is like celebrating that with him, fist bumping him, giving him a high five and say, geez, it was almost like great. If you look at Lewis and these guys' Twitter, what they put out immediately is they don't put out, oh, I'm so shattered, I'm so broken, you know. They, they put out, oh, freaking well done, my man. Like, you deserve that. It was a hard this year. We fought well. It was great to fight against you this year. That's the sort of stuff we hear in that space. Like, those are 20, 23, 24-year-old kids, <laughs> in my mind, <laughs> to be fair, you know. And yet they respond so differently than other spaces that you and I know and are aware of. Yeah, sorry, that might be an earful. Um, I can no, keep I'm... going. That's how it feels. I'm very passionate about this. I'm very passionate about this stuff. Yeah, I I just think uh, just to I suppose um, parallel on what you're saying. I, I like the the this bottom line for me. Performance is a fruit. It's an outcome that just happens at the back end of a whole series of of, of wins, as you said, of victories that has to happen in the inside of you actually sharpening who you're already um, kind of discovering who you are, right? As you express that. 
So if you create an environment where you surrendered in, if you go back to this sense of self, right? If you surrendered your, your selfish self, if you want to call it, you know, your, your personal interest only to the bigger self, or in this case, it's also a symbolic or synonym for the spirit, which will guide you towards that, right? Those become the natural environments for those performances to happen instantaneously. Or even if you're not getting the cup at that precise moment or the victory, you can send messages like you said there about those Grand Prix uh, guys and wish them the guy who was actually lifting the cup well or wishing, you know, it's his turn for that for that moment. But I think the the main thing is from your earlier example about actually I think you called him. I don't know the guy, so I'm just um, kind of roughing off what you're saying. <laughs> I like the the symbolism of that. Uh, even his thing, his website, Fear. You mentioned Fear. Fear of Honor, yeah. Fear of Honor. So it's it's almost a way in order for you to get to that um, kind of be expressive of who you really are. You need to push beyond that low level frequency of energy of fear, right? You need to let go of that fragile ego first before you can discover this new call it more mature crystal clear identity that is real for you right so you you got to move past the fear base and go higher up in the level of consciousness about yourself and when you do that then you become less um self-absorbed less narcissistic it's uh, um, a bit of a, a tyrant really a, a difficult one to contend with right you know become easier for others because then you, you're flowing a little bit more closely to, you know, we spoke about the love of the game and those sorts of things. You get to love yourself and appreciate yourself even more as well because you see that you're coming to add value and be a contributor um, to yourself and others. And as a result of it, this is a high level of consciousness. And it's easy to, to, to relate to that, you know. It becomes effortless then. So then you're almost allowing yourself to be in an environment of peak performances. You constantly refer to, just setting the conditions right for things to flow, you know. And 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 if it's tough, it's normally a sign that you don't need to double back up and try and force things. You just need to relax into this, let go of the ego, let go of the fear, still work uh, diligently, but just find the authenticity in that. And I think when you do that, you give others permission as well. You know, the old poet, uh, you know, why, what's your deepest fear? You know what I mean? If you can push past those fears, you'll discover this brilliance or genius on the inside. And I think we can support one another like that, then we're flowing in the spirit. And then we're finding our way in, the, in a more organic way where we're actually enhancing the genius to step forward. We're having conversation now and we are triggering certain memories in our day-to-day that is making and adding puzzle pieces, making this bigger picture a more clearer right and we can walk away empowered as a result of it so imagine you do that through skill sets and through competition and things like that imagine that's what it actually does for you that we enhancing one another in the process as opposed to yeah i'm switching gears now where competition actually creates division and polarization and separateness and me one over you and all those sorts of things right because that's what happens and, and rivalry can turn as you once mentioned rivalry can be a good thing but if you don't cut short the rivalry at, the, at an appropriate time where it's not just pulling the best out of you, but it's actually you wanting to actually get one over your rival, then you've lost your way again. So I think rivalry in the initial side should actually be like a trigger, like a flag, a warning flag to say, just be mindful. You're trying to dominate another year now. When I use the word dominate lightly, you're trying to overthrow another to preserve your own. Just see if you can find a way for both to win, right? Because that's where the sweet spot lies. So yes, you can still have excellence and you can still hit uh, the mark, but how do you navigate it? And that's where the spirit comes in, where it matures the self and it graduates it into the capital S self, which is the mm. collective self. Mm. Yeah, so. Sure. This idea, I mean, you shared this video with me and this idea of um, the rivalry, right? And and how that all plays out. I, I feel like it's, uh, it's sort of underpinned with this idea that maybe that 
in order to be um to be anything you have to one up you have to be better than somebody else we don't remember the guy that ran against Usain Bolt and came eighth we don't remember that guy's name we remember Usain Bolt right and so we all try and be Usain Bolt again in whatever sphere we are right there, there's something about the human condition at times that I think leads leans it leads itself to seeking that out somehow that is very important to us as human beings i don't know if it's a survival thing or what it might be but to be the man to be the guy the woman the the one that everybody else must follow i think there's something built into our dna around that right the strongest will survive or whatever you know and so when you, these are all ways in which you can show your strength, like a male bird will dance in front of a female. And if they look all pretty, then she'll take them. If not, well, then sorry, your genes as a bird stops. <laughs> um, and, 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 and so I think that's the challenge in sport is that, yes, we have this potentially this thing built into us. But the problem is we're also human beings. So we have what uh, reflex, reflexive thinking. The bird most probably forgets this chick and finds another one, right? And just carries on with life. Whereas human beings, we have reflexive thinking. It's one of the things that sets us apart, in that, apart from other creatures. In other words, we can think about our thinking. We can have awareness of how one thought connects to a thought. We have we're reflexive in our emotions. We can have one emotion about another emotion. I can feel crappy because I'm angry because I'm sad. Um, and so, so because we have these challenges as human beings, which is also built into us, we, we, everybody's got reflexive thinking. Everybody's got reflexive feeling. Because we have this built into us, I think when we go down this path, when we make somebody our rival, when we want to one-up them, that's when we start judging. Immediately it becomes a, okay, but so like you said, creates the gap. It creates the gap between where I am and where I need to be. And so now I can be aware of the gap. And for some people that the gap is just too big and they give up. For others, the gap is the thing that inspires them and they lean into that. For others, they don't give too much cre credence to the gap. They're on their own path. They define it by themselves. They're on their own little journey. And I'm not saying any of those are right or wrong. I, like I know where my preference would be, but hey, success can come through many paths. And so I think that's the other part is we've got to be careful that we think that we hear the story that this guy became successful in this way. And then we just pursue that way. We try and be the same, you know? And so that's where the mimicry thing comes in. And it's so visible. Like I think you used the example, maybe a couple of conversations ago about baby AB and now there's the new AB. So like Diebold Brevis is not even a de Villiers, but he's baby AB. And there's a Matthew de Villiers now that sort of has the same number on his back. And so we, I don't know, I don't know those people. I've never spoken with them, but I think it would be very sad if that's actually their, their driver is to try and be like somebody else. Because then I feel like we'll never see their greatness. That's my, my sense about it, you know? And so. I may be veering off track here in my head a little bit, right? So we, so we have this idea, we're rivals that creates the sense of desire or, or creates mimicry, which creates the sense of desire. And then that's what leads us to competition because then we, then we, then we really sort of, okay, but now I've got to be competitive with you. I can't have my teammate next to me and I can back them 100% and sort of uh, make sure the relationship's in a healthy place. I have to compete with you. And then that, I, I've got to feel bad when you do better than me because then my career is not advancing, you know, and your career is. So, hey, my career is advancing, yours not. Okay, goodbye, you know. And there's, that's empty in my mind. That's where you say it's like selfish, it's empty. It's in this pursuit of own gratification. And I think not always then aware of what you leave in your wake. You know, whatever's behind me, I don't really care. I don't look in my rear view. We don't have, unfortunately, as human beings, we don't have a rear view mirror in front of our face to see what we leave behind. We have two eyes that look out the front. You know, and so um, I, I think that once that competition is there, then it gets to a place where you're my enemy 
and you've got to be eliminated, you know, very easily. And so I think that's the challenge, right? Is, is if, like I always think it depends on the path you choose. So if you choose the path of outcome, if you choose the path of competition, of performance as not the fruit, but as the thing, and I've got to hold it and control it. And if you choose that path, that path has, con- it, it's got a, it's got a journey on it, right? It's got a, a journey of doubt, struggle, fear, um, feeling like rubbish. The, it, it's got all of that. And it's, and it's got that in the name of some achievement and what suffers in our, based on the conversation today for me is what suffers is that self. It's the, it's the relationship you have with yourself suffers hugely inner battles, inner, inner struggles with yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it feels silly, right? It's like I, every day I wake up and I feel a miserable idiot. Why? Because I'm battling myself. Where I, my, my 100%, I'm not, I don't even want to say like a half know this or I think. My 100% certainty is that when we eliminate the self-struggle, when we eliminate, the struggle's always going to be there, but it's about how we, how we engage with that struggle or how we think about it, if it's struggle or not. And if we let go of, not that I know if we can, but we, we surrender to this grander idea that there is a bigger picture at play, that there's a spirit that can guide me through, through my engagement with others and performance. When we choose that path, the, the path of spirit, then that's also got its journey. Now, that's not to say you will never doubt, you'll never fear, you, like, because the path is the path, right? If you go up a mountain, you can climb Mount Everest from the one side and you can climb it from the other side. They, 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 there's two paths. And hey, sometimes we've got to define our own path. But I think at the end of the day, whatever path you choose will have its repercussions. My 100% certainty is if we choose the path of the spirit, we eliminate a lot of the self-struggle and the struggle becomes more with the process and learning and growing and evolving. And I know 100% that that has more satisfaction to it. It fills the cup. That's part of what fills the cup is effort in the right spirit, struggle in the right spirit, failure in the right spirit. And I use right here in inverted commas, right? Maybe just in the spirit would be better to say it. That that's what fills the cup. I think that's what you allude to over time. You're filling your cup. You're filling your cup with the good stuff, you know, all the vitamins and the minerals and the, I don't know, whatever you, you need. And then at the end of the day, you can, if you're, if you're fortunate enough and if it's meant for you, you'll lift the cup. But if you don't, then it's not like your legacy is defined by that. My legacy is defined by how I treated the person on the road, how I treated the lady behind the till, how I, how I evolved and grew from a bad relationship I had and what I learned from there. Like, I think then it's defined by that. Yeah, sorry, my thoughts. Again, I'm running here. So we, we have to distinguish um, the past almost 30, 35 minutes we've been talking about the self when it comes to almost the individual self, the one that we are very much aware of, the one that we relate to easily because it looks very convincingly that it's uh, you there, I'm over here, so it's two separate selves, right? Mm. And that's the isolated, distinguished self. And definitely, the, the, the spirit definitely can, as you articulated now, can definitely appeal and keep you safeguarded, a little bit more mature, and keep you like kind of growing that self. But there is also a higher dimension, which I also want to bring in at the back end here now. A higher dimension or higher level of consciousness of self, which is what I've kept referring to as the capital S. When you graduate to another level where you realize that there's no separation between myself, Russell, and myself, and yourself, Jody. It's actually one self. Mm. Because what I do to you, I do to myself in some shape or form, right? Essentially, what it boils down to is that inclusive spirit, that inclusive S where there is no separation, there is only oneness. And when you go down to any forms of, you know, any forms of sense of religion based, you will have this concept, concept coming through, right? 
because it applies to the golden rule. This is where you tie the two selfish shelves, the small S with the big S, right? When you start saying treat others like you want to be treated, because the actual fact is no other. There is only one. So what you do to another, you're doing to yourself. So if you're standing there on the top, having achieved a certain thing and you're obnoxious and you want to rub in other people's faces, your moment of that down the line will come where someone's going to rub that in your face because what you did to that other, you're doing to yourself. It's just going to happen later. But if you treat someone like you're saying, well, whilst you're on the top because you understand that who you are is a representative of every, everyone, right? Then you have this expanded understanding of the capital cell. And that is what the spirit offers. It offers you a way to get away from this, just me, myself, and I, <laughs> right? You can actually go me, myself, and I spirit, because the spirit in capital S will take you away from that I, because everything seems to be pointing to the words, that's what me, 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 mine, 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 you know? And we all know the analogy like with kids, as soon as they start saying, oh, you're desiring this now, I also want to desire those maina, 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 right? And we don't want to keep acting like small kids, you know, with that small S. We want to actually get to the spirit where we start saying, what's best for all? And therefore, can I treat you like I want to be treated? The capital S, the mature S. And that is what the spirit offers us. It offers us a way out from the small S because ultimately we go into our corners feeling a little bit dissatisfied. Even if we say it's Mena, I'm sitting alone in the corner with my Mena. <laughs> And I can't have anyone to play and enjoy it with because it's, I, it's either mine, I'm taking my bat and my ball and I'm going home, so no one plays, <laughs> you know? And so the game is like, but what the spirit will say is, no, stop saying mine, say it's ours or whatever, or share what's yours and let us all enjoy in the right spirit. And then we're all winning. And I think that's what we're talking about. So when you talk about relating to yourself, can you graduate the small S into the big S and allow the spirit to be a guide to help you get there because it is that's exactly why it's there it's for you to enhance the relationship to the higher dimension of engagement hmm. yeah i love that i love that i think uh, i don't know if i want to add necessarily a lot onto that right because i think you said those things so eloquently um, and it has me sort of in a space of a little bit of introspection here yeah, in, in this immediacy of the moment. My, 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 my only thought with that is, I think this is the place where athletes struggle. It's the place where people struggle because we're so in pursuit of our stuff, you know, my stuff. We're so in pursuit of that. And this could be true whether you're an accountant pursuing the higher position at your job, right? It could be true if you're a stay-at-home mom and you're pursuing just the education of your kids. You know, it, 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 it's really any sphere of life. But I think this is the, this is the part that trips athletes up in a big way. The understanding that if I win, it's not me winning. It's actually us winning. If our team wins, it's not our team that's winning. It's the game that's winning. And if it's, if it's the game, it's not just our game that's winning. It's basically almost like saying humanity is winning, you know, because it's another exhibition of how as humans we can be great. Because actually we're all busy doing this thing, you know. And I'm wondering, like, when teams struggle, because I know we're going to lead into this part, right, and focus on sort of team environments and things like that. But if, team, if and when teams struggle, just based on our conversation now, if we look at the team as a person, as a living organism, like I could look at myself, if a team is struggling or not in a happy space, like it makes so much sense in my head right now, <laughs> this whole idea of it's us versus them, right? Versus saying as a team, it's not us versus them. It's about a collective excellence and we actually need them to show up and push us. Australia need India right now to push them like that, to see what they've got, if they still got it, right? If, to see if they can rise to the occasion. 
my sense is if they go and they say, well, we've just got to beat them. And, you know, instead of maybe honoring the game and honoring the struggle and honoring the excellence and of, of what the game maybe now demands of them because of the opposition that they're against, then they almost probably end up on the wrong side of this. And when they can honor it, who knows, they might win, they might still lose. Maybe it's a first test bliss for, for, for India. Who knows, right? Long way to go. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious to watch it play out. I know it's not something you and I agreed on, but with this idea, right, this understanding that there is, there is things beyond us, you know, that we, that's within our reach very easily, which I think we neglect at times. So, yeah. Thank you for this conversation, Russell. I don't know if anything that I just said made any sense <laughs> at all. Yeah. It's maybe no, just no. the space I'm finding myself in at this point in time, but yeah, thank thank you for um, thank you for this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed adding my value because it's something that I'm passionate about. No, I've really enjoyed sort of the lens that you added on towards the end. Yeah, like I think that's pretty awesome. I think leading into the next one, Jared, I just want to say this. Uh, I think we, what we've discovered through this conversation and what we're looking to do next is that we, we have a choice always um, as we participate, as we engage, even if we're just watching it. Either we, and you can use this directly inside cricket, the, the phraseology, the survival of the fittest. And you know what fitness is like in, in cricket spaces, right? The fittest tends to be the ones who can perform the best. But anyway, if we have a mentality or a philosophy or an approach of survival of the fittest, it's, necess it's going to, therefore, mean that other people are going to be falling along the wayside because only fit is going to be thriving, right? Not everyone. However, there's a bridge between that world of survival of fitness versus one for all, all for one. And it's, again, it's not my team versus another team. It's the grander good of the game at large. So if you're having one for all and all for one type of cognizance, right, the bridge between those two, survival of fitness and one for all, all for one, is the spirit. And that's the beauty of it. And that's where champion teaming comes from. That's where engagement comes from. That's where life comes from. And we get for once liberated from this competition of Maina versus yours and who's on the top, who's not on the top, and the sense of competition. And we feel liberated to actually just share and enjoy the love of this game. by Awesome. Thank you very much, Russell. I've, um, I've really enjoyed this. Yeah. Good. See everyone Thanks in the good. next one. Cheers. Yeah, for sure.